All right, everyone. I have a confession to make. You ready? <laughs> I am an emotional person. I am the kind of person who wears my heart on my sleeve. I have a terrible poker face, and I have never shied away from telling anyone how I feel about something. Now let's be clear, I don't cry in office meetings, and I don't throw temper tantrums at work. But I do regularly get very emotional about the work that I do, and I feel excitement and joy, and sometimes frustration and anger and sadness when my work doesn't go right. Coming from a career in human resources, where my work so often intersected and impacted the employees that I supported, there was a long time where I thought that this was a bad thing, that I was so emotional about my work. That because I was so emotional, I was somehow less professional than everyone else. But I'm here today to tell you that I've been successful in my career, not in spite of my emotions, but because of them. And I am challenging each and every one of you to rethink how you think about bringing emotions into the workplace. For a very long time, we have all thought that to be professional, we should shut off our emotions at work. Right? We shouldn't show anyone that we're frustrated or that we're angry. But research tells us that emotions are not some secondary function of our brain that we can just choose to turn off or ignore. They're actually an integral part of what it means to think and to reason. And they help us make better decisions. If we use emotional intelligence and emotional data to make those decisions, we need to encourage our employees to bring their emotions into the workplace and use those emotions with emotional intelligence to make better decisions, make better products, make our organizations better. Now, think about what I just said. Emotional data. Data. Now, in our organizations today, we are collecting data about everything, right? Data on how fast someone clicks a button in an app, how many applications we get for a particular job, how fast something takes to make, or how much it costs. And all that data helps us make better decisions to make our products better. But data is more than time, or clicks, or cost. Data can come from emotions, too. So let me give you an example. How many of you play the guitar? Anyone? A couple. All right, a couple. Now, how many of you have tried to play the guitar? <laughs> yeah. Almost all of us, right? And if you're like me, you didn't make it to the I play the guitar because you got frustrated, right? Over the last year, Fender, Fender Guitars, has been conducting a vast market research study where they wanted to better understand who their customers are. And through that study, they found that 45% of their customers every year come from very first-time guitar players. 45% every year. That is a huge portion of their market. But what they also found was that 90% of those first-time guitar players abandoned their guitar playing dreams in the very first year. Probably like all of you, right? Why? Because they got frustrated. Their fingers hurt. They couldn't figure out the chords. It took way too long to learn their very first song. And frustration led to abandonment and frustration is emotional data. Fender was able to key in on this piece of emotional data as being key to driving their sales for the future. And through this, Fender Play was born. It's a digital app that you can download, and it'll teach you how to play the guitar in a few simple, easy-to-understand steps. They say they can have you playing your very first song in under 30 minutes. Now, if I had been able to play my very first song in under 30 minutes, I would have been so excited. Everyone I know would have had to listen to that song over and over <laughs> and over and over again until I made it into the next phase of the app. And that joy, that excitement, is more emotional data that Fender can use to drive their sales further and improve their product. Now, if we are going to really come to value emotions in the workplace, we must start first by checking our bias around emotional expression. Every single one of us expresses our emotions in different ways. And if we deviate from the way people expect that we should express our emotions, 
there could be negative consequences. So let me give you an example. If you are like me, and you would be willing to say that you are an emotional person, raise your hand. All right, look around the room. There are way more women's hand raised than men. And why? Well, I would assert it's because we as women have been told for a very long time through gender roles and norms that we are emotional. And you men have been told for a very long time that you should not be emotional. Women are emotional. Men should not be emotional. These are biases that we have about how people express emotion. And they're not necessarily true, but we've come to accept them. And we need to change how we think about our perception of emotional expression. An example, if you are a woman who expresses excitement and enthusiasm, like I do often, but through confidence and direct communication, you're often told in the workplace that you're aggressive or worse. And if you're a man who expresses those same emotions through direct communication and excitement, you're labeled passionate or assertive. Now, what about crying? I told you at the beginning of this talk that I've yet to cry in a work meeting. But I promise you, it is not because I have never felt sadness over the work that I'm doing or frustration or disappointment. It's because I know and understand how crying is perceived in the workplace. People who cry are seen as weak. And especially for a woman, crying in the workplace, they're seen as weak, possibly unstable, maybe even manipulative. What about men who cry? In 2008, Howard Schultz stepped back into the role of CEO at Starbucks. 2008, it was the height of the Great Recession, and Starbucks was closing hundreds of stores throughout the country. They were laying off thousands of workers, and Schultz was distraught. He was sad for the company that he had built and where it was and what they were having to do. In his very first meeting back as CEO, in front of the entire organization, he broke down in tears. And was he seen as weak or unstable as their new leader? No, he was praised, praised for being emotionally vulnerable. Now I want to be clear, I am not for one second saying that Schultz should not have been praised. I do believe that we need that kind of emotional vulnerability from our leaders. My question to you is if Schultz had been a female CEO, would his tears have been perceived the same way? If we're being honest with ourselves, probably not. And beyond bias from gender, emotional expression bias can come in any form, race, religion, ethnicity, we all assume things based on who we are looking at and the emotions that they express in front of us. Emotional intelligence is understanding your emotions, managing those actions you take in response to your emotions, and understanding how your emotions will be perceived by others and the perception of others' emotions around you. The perception of others' emotions is where our biases need to be checked. Beyond just our bias, there's also a real danger when expressing emotion in the workplace right now. Your industry, your organizational culture, your level within the organization could change how your emotions are perceived and whether or not it could impact your career. But we need to understand that research tells us the more people express their emotions in a reasonable way about the work that they're doing, the better their work is. In 2012, Google wanted to better understand their teams, right? Google, pretty successful company, and they wanted to understand why some of their teams were wildly successful, helping them with that success, and others were just average. So they asked organizational psychologists and their people analytics team to conduct hundreds of internal interviews. They named this project Project Aristotle. They wanted to find out why these teams were so successful. 
So they asked them questions about their work. They looked at their skills, they looked at their resumes, they asked each other questions about the work that they were doing and how they worked together. What did they find? Well, related to our talk today, they found that who was on the team mattered less than how the team worked together. That the teams that were most successful, the core element that existed in those teams, psychological safety. Psychological safety means that the teams felt open and vulnerable with one another. They were willing to take risks and share ideas and share their thoughts and yes, even their emotions. Emotional vulnerability led to better ideas and better products because the teams that were able to say, I'm worried about this, or I don't know, I don't think this works, there's just something in my gut telling me. The ones who were able to express how they were feeling about the work that they were doing, they were the ones that questioned the work and found the better answers and led to better outcomes. We are moving into organizations where technology is going to become more prevalent every day, every day. And as we do, that technology is going to make us faster and better and capable of more in the future. But the real competitive advantage will come from our ability to connect with people on an emotional level, to build teams of organizations where collaboration is at its finest because teams are open and vulnerable with one another when it comes to their emotions. As technology comes into our organizations more and more, the struggle to stay human will be the struggle to find the emotional data, to express the emotional vulnerability, and to use emotional intelligence to build better teams and better organizations. So, what can you do today? First, I'm asking each and every one of you to start thinking about your own emotional intelligence. Think about the emotions that you're feeling. Stop suppressing them. Learn to manage the actions you take in response to them, but imagine those feelings are natural and I'm allowed to have them about my work. There are books, there are other TED Talks, there are great surveys that you can take backed by research that can help you identify ways to improve your own emotional intelligence. Second, we need to start checking our bias around emotional expression. The next time someone expresses an emotion in front of you that you're not expecting, stop and say, hey, they're human. <laughs> they're allowed to express their emotions. And think about how your bias might be affecting how you're viewing the emotions that they're expressing. And finally, if you are a manager or a leader in an organization, or if you plan to be a manager or a leader in the future, I am urging you to learn to understand the importance of psychological safety in the workplace. Go and read research, Brene Brown's Dare to Lead, or look for the emotional intelligence surveys that Google did. Look at their Project Aristotle work. It's all out there, they're great resources. The more you learn to allow your team to express their emotions about the work that they're doing, the better their work's gonna be. If you want me to be an exceptional employee, then you need to allow me the freedom to express my emotions about my work and be reasonably emotional, even though that might mean that sometimes I get angry or frustrated or sad about my work. But you will also see my passion, my excitement, and my enthusiasm when we are successful together. You will see great work from me because I will be free to bring my emotions to work. I challenge you to do the same. Thank you. <laughs>